All right, we didn't get too far into parental care and family conflict last time, but do you guys have any questions over what we did cover? No. No. Everybody's like, no. All right, then. We were just talking about these differences in tendency towards parental care and who provides parental care. And I asked you to kind of think about what the, what the aspects of these different species' reproductive patterns were and their, um, their investment and when that investment occurs to see if that um, gives you any insight into why, for example, mammals have mostly females, females only providing parental care, fishes tend towards male only, and birds um, are by parental care in many cases. Uh, what was the rationale for each of these? And what else do mammals do? Yeah, they gestate the offspring also. So there's this long period that females are associated with the offspring, both because of gestation and also uh, early parental care is done by milk production, which is only done by females. What was the deal with fishes? Okay, so part of it is ensuring paternity. What are other aspects that might be influencing fish? Um, it can attract other like can attract other females because um, males having eggs in the nest might be an indicator of male quality. Um, there's another reason that we'll talk about here in a little while. What was the deal with birds? <laughs> baby birds are really needy. It takes a lot of energy to, to get a baby bird to fledging because um, they have high metabolic rates. And so, in many cases, a single parent providing parental care is not going to get the job done. So, what aspects uh, affect who cares and how much? Um, part of this is the idea of constraint. And so, for, for mammals, for example, um, female mammals operate under a set of physiological constraints in that... Mammals give live birth, the females gestate the offspring for a long period of time, and then they also are the one member of mammals, in terms of males versus females, that are capable of provisioning offspring when they're young. And so this explains to a huge degree why uh, you see in mammals female-only parental care. And so um, this idea that, that you're evolutionary history and your physiology, you have evolved in such a way that then constrains what your options are in terms of whether or not you, the male, or you, the female, are going to be, uh, be providing uh, parental care becomes important. Um, fish don't have those same physiological constraints and life history constraints, and so fish do something totally, totally different. Um, if you look at this by taxonomic grouping, when we think about Invertebrates versus fish versus amphibians versus reptiles, birds, mammals. Uh, in invertebrates, parental care is just generally uncommon. Uh, when it does occur, it is usually going to be female only. Uh, male only care is very, very rare, as is by parental care. Generally, with insects, as we've already talked, uh, you oftentimes have uh, females producing tons of eggs. Uh, those eggs are released to the environment, and then um, the strategy here is just to produce so many offspring that if a couple of them make it to maturity, then you've kind of done, done your job. In which case, parental care provided to all those offspring really isn't going to probably help much. Um, also, aspects of their life cycle um, have an influence on this. 
we've talked about dung beetles. What do dung beetles do when they reproduce? So a uh, male will arrive at a pad of dung. Uh, he guards the pad of dung. The female will ball up a, a pile of dung, dig a, dig a burrow, put the ball of dung down in the burrow, and then what do they do? Talked about this when we talked about dung beetles and sexual selection. The male guards that dung pile to prevent sneakers from coming in and copulating with that female, but what does the female do with the ball of dung down in the burrow? Mm-hmm. What is the female going to do in terms of reproduction? Going to lay eggs or eggs on that ball of dung. Usually it's just a single egg on that ball of dung. And then when that egg hatches, what does that larva do? It eats the dung. And so in this case, parental care by the female is basically just done in provisioning the, the offspring with a ball of dung to eat. And parental care doesn't go any further than that. The parents aren't, aren't minding that ball of dung or anything else. It's underground. They're not going and getting it food because they've already provisioned it with all of the food that, that it needs. Um, yeah, so many other eggs of, of invertebrates. I'm thinking of insects for the most part. Uh, they're, just, they're just left out in nature and then they hatch and they either hatch into larvae. So, for example, you look at flies. A flesh fly will lay their eggs on a dead animal, and then they hatch. And then, once again, the diet of the adult is totally different from the diet of the offspring. Uh, the only parental care that that individual has, has exercised at all is placing her eggs in an appropriate place. Um, fish... On the other hand, are very different. Um, the um, ratio of male only to biparental care to female only is 931. And so the vast majority of fish species um, engage in male only biparental care if they engage in parental care at all. And there are a lot of fish that don't engage in, in parental care at all. But when they do, it, it's mostly male care. And uh, we'll talk about all the reasons that, that this operates this way. Um, with amphibians, there's an equal division of male-only and female-only care. Um, this, once again, has to do with um, kind of what's necessary for the offspring to survive and who's going to be sticking around with those offspring after they've been fertilized. And so you see some situations where, for example, poison dart frogs, um, the offspring don't survive in, unless you can move them from one bromeliad to another. So the, the, um, the tadpoles will swim up onto the back of the poison dart frog, and then the adult hops and goes to another bromeliad and then drops off the, the tadpoles in a new bromeliad because the old bromeliad has run out of resources. Once again, this depends who's doing this transporting, whether it's the male or the female, depends upon what the costs and benefits are to the, the male and the female in doing this. In many cases, uh, males are territorial, and the females come into the male's territory and lay the eggs, and then the, the male, because he's guarding the territory, because that's a good resource for females, will oftentimes be the one that provides uh, parental care. By parental care, though, is, is very uncommon. Uh, reptiles generally um, don't have a lot of parental care, um, but usually it's either the female or, or biparental care, although biparental care is still still pretty uncommon. The norm in reptiles is, is no parental care beyond laying your eggs in a place where, where they will hatch out. Birds. 90% uh, of the species have biparental care. Um, Females often invest more in care, even when there is biparental care. And in some cases, there are helpers. And so we will talk later about um, Africa, uh, sorry, not African, uh, scrub jays that occur in Florida. 
this is a species where the reproductive success of newly matured adults is really, really low. And what you find in this system is that um, the siblings will stick around and care for their newer siblings because the young adult scrub jays can gain more reproductive success by aiding their parents in raising their siblings than they would if they went off and started nests on their own, uh, most of which are going to fail the first couple of years that you're an adult as a scrub jay. And so that's what they mean when they talk about helpers assisting, um, assisting in parental care. Um, of those 10% where it's not by parental care, the vast majority of those are female-only care. Male care alone is, is once again, very, very rare. Um, and then in mammals, um, they, females provide care in all species. Um, in 95% of the species, the female cares alone, and 5% the male helps too. But uh, obviously, because of physiological constraints, there is no male-only child care. Um, so we see these taxonomic sorts of, of trends. So a big difference, well, so one of the big differences when we look at fishes, and so a lot of this work has been done in fishes uh, because there's a wide variety of different ways of going about reproduction in fishes. So if we look at the bony, what we sometimes call the bony fishes, the, the teleos fishes, um, these are things like perch and bass and, and gobies and guppies and all these things, not sharks and skates and rays. Um, we find that there are species that have internal fertilization and species that have external fertilization. And of the systems that have been studied at the time that this book was published, when you look at internal fertilization, uh, the majority of species that exhibit internal fertilization have female parental care. As soon as you shift to species where there's external fertilization, uh, you see that uh, a lot of those species exhibit male parental care. And so the mode of fertilization kind of sets the stage for who provides parental care. And um, because most species are external fertilizing species, then male parental care is, is far more common than, than female parental care. And so the book asked the question, why? And they put up three hypotheses, one of which we've talked about already, paternity certainty. A second is the order of gamete release. And a third is association. And so let's talk about each of these. We've already talked a little bit about certainty of paternity. Um, what we mean by that is that um, the male is reliable that those eggs that he has control over have been fertilized by him. And he knows this because um, eggs are laid at the same time, which this gets back to the order of gamete release. And so in this case, when you have fish where gamete release is simultaneous, the female ejects her eggs, the male ejects his sperm, and that simultaneous release is there, which presumably gives the male a high certainty of paternity. There's less sperm competition than with internal fertilization because you know that those eggs were ejected by that female at this moment, so those are your sperm. And as long as you keep sneakers away, you're, you're good to go. But of course, there's also a high proportion of species and fishes where there are sneaker males that will come in and try and add their sperm to an already resident male's nest. In the end, you're more likely to provide parental care if you are certain of paternity. Um, did I ever tell you about what I did after I graduated with my PhD? Went to Peru and worked with some linguists for about six months and then I came back uh, to Texas and I had no money and I needed a job. And uh, a friend of mine said to me one day, hey, there's this, there's this genetic screening lab over in Dallas. I was in the Dallas-Fort Worth area at the time uh, that are looking for somebody to, to work in their lab. Why don't you apply there? I applied there. Um, one of the weirdest job interviews I've ever been on because I had no molecular skills. I was an ecologist. And they're like, you have no molecular skills. Why would we hire you? I'm like, I'm a PhD. That means I'm infinitely trainable. 
I'll learn what your people know and I'll learn it faster than anybody else you've ever trained. And if I don't, fire me at the end of the training period. And so I took the job, I learned the stuff, and I worked there until I quit to go and teach in, in Pennsylvania. Um, it was a paternity testing lab. I also had a forensics lab. This was back in the old days of doing genetic testing. So this was 1996, um, 1997. And um, this company had contracts with Florida, state of Texas, Arizona, the southern half of California. And if there was a paternity case in the courts in any of those jurisdictions, they sent the samples to GeneScreen. GeneScreen was the name of the company. And when you get a paternity case, it generally has a mother, one or more alleged fathers, and then a set of children. And we used restriction fragment length polymorphisms at the time. Do you guys know what restriction fragment length polymorphisms are? RFLPs, they don't teach you about restriction. You, they teach you about restriction enzymes in genetics now, don't they? What does a restriction enzyme do? Brush off your old genetic knowledge. Yeah. Oh, was it, was that one you took it when it was when it was? <laughs> okay, so a restriction enzyme is just an enzyme that cuts a DNA at a particular sequence, and so there are these recognition sequences, and the restriction enzyme just cuts it at a known at a known sequence of base pairs. And so those sequences may occur in all kinds of places all over the genome. And what it does is it cuts up the DNA. And because these sequences are just kind of randomly distributed around the genome, it breaks up the genome into, the chromosomes, into different fragment lengths. And you can run those out on a gel. And the longest, the longest fragments stay close to the, where you put the, your sample in. And the smaller fragments get drugged further through the, through the um through the gel, and so it was kind of the first method of doing um, genetic fingerprinting. And so you would get you would get bands on a gel. You put you put the sample in at the top of the gel, and then you run the gel. Fragments move in this direction. <coughs> Excuse me. Larger fragments stay at the top. Smaller fragments move further down, and the smallest fragments move all the way down. You have an alleged, sorry. Yeah, mother, the alleged father. You have an alleged father. Um, And another alleged father that looks like this. Clearly, this marker is not informative because the mother and the alleged father um, possess that. Um, this marker is not informative because the mother and another alleged father possess that. But all these other markers are informative because all of the children should be getting all of their markers, either from the mother or from the father. And so these two children could have gotten this marker from the mother or the father, but this child had to have gotten this marker from this alleged father. This child might not have gotten that marker from its mother, but got this marker from um, that alleged father and got this marker probably from that mother or that alleged father, et cetera, et cetera. So you can, you can determine, you can assess paternity. Well, why am I telling you this? Why? So, so this is a place we got in about 300 cases a day, which means that we, so we ran them through in a week time period. So we basically ran two sets of cases so um, we basically receive cases six days a week. So we got about 1,800 cases a week for paternity testing. Why so many cases? 
other than the, the humans are terrible and, and life is depressing. <laughs> <laughs> why are why are people paying? So and this this cost about twelve hundred dollars a case at the time. It was really expensive to do this because this was the early days. Why why did this company make scads and scads of money off of paternity testing? People are doing what? Because why? Because they're doing what? Well, no, they're. Yes, but they're they're in the courts for parental care because what's happening? They're getting divorced, and the dude is saying she slept with my best friend, and those are not my kids, and so. You are less likely to provide parental care if you are more certain of paternity, and at least the way it plays out in American courts, if you're the baby daddy and you're getting divorced, you need to provide parental care. Um, what will not surprise you at all is in almost all these cases, what was the outcome? Oh, you're, you're always the father. I, I can remember very few cases where the dad who was trying to get out of paying child support was actually actually had a case that, no, those are not my, my kids. Um, so it was a big outlay of money to get something tested that ended up showing what you probably already knew in your heart of hearts. Anyway, those are my kids. That's why they have your nose and your eyes and your eyebrows and your hairy ears and, and et cetera. So dudes don't want to provide parental care if those offspring aren't theirs. In the case of humans, there is the possibility that you have, um, that you have uncertainty of paternity because of internal fertilization. But at least in humans, it was, it was actually a little, um, well, it was not quite as depressing as it could have been because in most cases, people are being, you know, what is it? Um, people are being faithful in in the marriage contract for the most part, at least to the point that they're not they're not having offspring uh, with with your non married partner in in most cases. Now there were exceptions. There was one case that I that stands out in my mind because it it was shocking. It was so shocking we had to run the analysis over again. We had a mother three alleged fathers and like five kids and none of the kids matched any of the alleged fathers and so we thought to ourselves okay we messed something up so we pulled all the samples out of the freezer ran them all again and got the same result and then we're thinking about it i'm like you would think that those were your three best bets for the alleged father I really wonder what that person's life must be like if those were your three best bets and, and you struck out on all three of them. But but that was the the way outlier exception. I'm just imagining her looking at the results and being like, wow, I really would have thought I got one of them right. Yeah, yeah. That was a, a real head scratcher for us. But the point of this story isn't about this particular woman. The point is that both humans and non-humans are going to be more likely to provide parental care on the part of the male if you are certain of paternity. And the easiest way to be certain of paternity is through the process of external fertilization, which is why this is the way it is to a certain degree. One of the other things about external fertilization is that if, as a part of external fertilization, you're guarding eggs to prevent cuckoldry, you also just are there providing parental care, at least in the form of protection for these offspring, because you're trying to enhance your sense of, of paternity certainty. But in these cases where you have external fertilization, um, there's the issue of gamete release. With internal fertilization, um, males are the first with the opportunity to escape. So the, the, the whole thing about the order of gamete release is the individual that releases their gametes first is the individual that has the first opportunity to leave. So 
So with internal fertilization, the males release their gametes first into the female. The female is still holding on to her gametes, so she's kind of stuck with the offspring at that point. With external fertilization, males must release eggs last, so the females are the first with the opportunity to escape. Therefore, um, the females are the ones with the first opportunity to escape. Uh, but your authors of your textbook reject this idea as, as an idea for explaining this tendency here uh, for two reasons. Do you recall from the reading what those two reasons are? So in some fishes, the males are first and the females release second. But in a good number of fish, we have what we refer to as simultaneous release of the gametes. In these cases, were you about to pull out your book? Yeah, I didn't have it. Oh, you don't have it. Mason has his, though. He does. What happens in cases of simultaneous release? You guys know I'm occasionally going to ask you questions. It's after the table. So towards the beginning of the chapter. Nope, not, not that far back, I don't think. Nope. Nope. It is back. No. Yeah. No, oh, you're in the wrong chapter altogether. Ah, order of gimme release. Mason, what does it say about simultaneous release? No, just read the part that is relevant to 36 out of 46 species that have simultaneous release. Do what in terms of parental care? I think it's at the bottom of the first page of this. Provided by who? So in 36 out of 46 of the species that have been studied that have simultaneous release, it's monoparental care, and that monoparental care is provided by the male. And so in this case, there should be a 50-50 chance of each one providing parental care if the order of gamete release was the reason. But in this case, the majority of the monoparental care is provided by the male, with less being provided by the female. But if it was really due to order of gamete release, we should expect 50% of parental care to be provided by females and 50% to be provided by males. What's the second reason? Mason, since you've got the book there. Yeah, so in this case, the males release first, and so they, in theory, have the opportunity to abandon, to, to uh, escape first, but they actually stay. And as it turns out, these are the same species of fish where the presence of a nest with a lot of female eggs in it is what for the male. It goes on to say this in that same paragraph. Males with eggs are more attractive to females. So not only does sticking around to provide parental care increase the success of the eggs that are already in the nest, um, the male sticking around to guard that nest uh, just in actually enhances the perception of quality in that male and increases his fitness in that he gets to mate with more, more females as a result of this.
You were going to say something, Mason? No. The last idea, which is one that we haven't talked about, is association, the association hypothesis. The amount of time that you are in association with embryos affects the decision to desert. And the way that works is the longer you are in association with the offspring, uh, the embryos, the, the less likely you are to desert. Um, with internal fertilization, females are associated with the embryos for a longer period of time. Therefore, they're the ones that provide parental care. And uh, because males guard a territory to attract future females, they're more associated with the embryos. So you see that these three hypotheses are not necessarily completely independent of one another. Uh, they actually might reinforce this tendency for males to provide parental care in one situation and females to provide parental care in another situation. So nest guarding behavior might actually be a pre-adaptation to male parental care in the case of these fish that, that build nests. And so uh, this also explains why male parental care is more common in species that are territorial, just this association with the offspring. So those are the, the three reasons that we think that those species with external fertilization are more likely to have male parental care than species with internal fertilization. Association, order of gamete release, although your textbook authors don't really buy that explanation, and then uh, just the certainty of paternity issue. And males will go to quite extreme lengths to assure paternity. Uh, they will guard females uh, for long periods of time. We've already seen this in another, a number of examples. Um, that's one of the reasons you set up territories is so that you have exclusive access to the females that you have access to, etc. All right. We have used optimality models in the past to talk about different behaviors. You can also use optimality arguments when you think about parental investment. And so this is an idea put forth by uh, Trivers back in 1972 um, that basically asks the question, what level of parental care is optimal for a parent to expend on offspring? And the thing about this is that what is optimal for a male parent may not be the same as what is optimal for a female parent, and this is where you get into sexual conflict over parental care. And so this essentially asks, what are the costs and benefits of parental care? As in many cases, the costs will be constant. Uh, the more care you provide, the more it's going to cost you, and that just goes up and up and up and up. And so um, the more you invest, the more it costs you. But oftentimes the benefit, the shape of that curve, is once again a diminishing returns curve. There comes a point when adding more investment doesn't necessarily improve the outcome. Uh, think about you guys. You guys were born. Your parents fed you. They continue to feed you all through kindergarten and grade school and middle school and high school. And now, presumably, they're maybe contributing to your college careers to get you through college so that you can hopefully do what? Get out, get a job, be independent and on your own. So there are costs to raising offspring and making your offspring successful in humans and your parents are continuing to expend costs. The more they invest, the costlier it is. How old are you guys? 21? 22? 20? At 25, are your parents still going to be willing to invest in your future? What's that? You got it. Why? Because at that point, continuing to invest in you, continuing to support you, has now lost all of its benefit. Because all it's doing now is holding you back, in a sense, because you're living in the basement without a job. Whereas if they booted you out, you might actually get more encouraged to go and get a job. So there comes a point where, where 
the the costs really do outweigh the benefits. They could continue to support you, but it's not benefiting them, and it's really not benefiting your success as well. And so what an optimality argument says is that parents should invest up to the point where you have the maximum difference between the benefit that is gained from investment in offspring and what the cost is. So you keep providing parental care because here the difference between the benefit and the cost is really low, but there comes a point because the cost curve is a straight line and the benefit curve is a diminishing returns curve, there comes a point somewhere in this intermediate parental care area where the parent needs to make the decision, okay, this is where parental care shuts down because I could continue exerting more parental care, but that incurs more costs and the costs are increasing in a linear fashion, but the, the benefits, they're still increasing, but they're increasing at a decreasing rate. Now, if you're a parent, you want to cut off parental care at this point, but if you're an offspring, what do you want the parents to do? Give me a little more, right? Give me a little more. It doesn't cost you that much, but I benefit from it. But so, so you have parents who should stop inputting parental care here, but you have offspring who want parents to, to put in more. That then reduces the benefit of parental care from the parent's standpoint. And this is where we get into thinking about conflicts between parents and offspring in terms of how much parental care is, is being provided. So there's this trade-off in the, in the terms of thinking of it from the parent's perspective between the number of offspring that you have and the quality of offspring within a single reproductive effort. And this gets into what we refer to as, as life history theory. So we've talked about this trade-off before. Just want to revisit it for you. Um, because organisms have a certain amount of energy available to them, they can divide this energy up between growth and maintenance, versus reproduction. But then, within this reproduction, what are the choices that individuals have to make? You can either invest all of your energy for reproduction into one very large offspring, two smaller offspring, four even smaller offspring, eight even smaller offspring, etc., etc., etc. The more offspring you create, the smaller they are. Presumably, as they get smaller, they are less likely to survive. So we oftentimes equate offspring size and parents' investment in offspring size uh, as being kind of consistent with smaller offspring generally survive less. And so you have to ask yourself, how many offspring do you put out into the world versus how good are those offspring in terms of their ability to survive? And this is where the classic size number trade-off in life history theory comes from. You can't produce an infinite number of infinitely large offspring. Just can't work that way. If you produce a lot of offspring, they have to be small because you're limited in, in energy. And if you produce fewer offspring, you can make them larger. Or, or if you opt to produce larger offspring, you have to produce fewer of them because you have a finite amount of energy. This is within, within a reproductive effort. What's the other thing that we have to think about?
if you don't have to worry about growth and maintenance, if you don't have to worry about living to, to live another day, breed another day, what can you dump all of your energy into? You can just say, well, screw growth and maintenance. I'm going to dump all of my energy into reproduction. So now I can take this large number of offspring and I can make them twice as big because I'm not storing anything in reserves. So anything that you put into this first reproductive effort is energy that probably eats into a second reproductive effort. So there are also trade-offs between what we call the current reproduction versus future reproduction. Energy that you use today is not necessarily energy that you can use tomorrow. So this is another kind of trade-off. Trade-off between current investment and future investment in reproduction. So trade-offs within a brood are basically, if you make too many small offspring, none of them survive. If you make too few large offspring, you're not putting very many copies of your genes out into the world, and as a result, uh, you're being outcompeted by other members of your population in terms of, of what proportion of the offspring pool is due to your offspring. And so your fitness is lower relative to the fitness of other individuals. So we've mentioned relative fitness early on in this uh, semester. Uh, somebody give me an idea of what I mean when I refer to relative fitness. I believe I use the example of reproduction in the biology department. Yeah. Four has kids. Who's the most fit? So within the biology department, I believe Vora has three kids. Uh, Dr. Ron Lee and Dr. Shi have three kids. Um, Dr. Reynolds has two kids. Dr. Judd has none. I have none. So Dr. Judd and I are, are our absolute fitness is zero. Dr. Reynolds' absolute fitness is two. Vora and Ron Lee and Shi, their absolute fitness is three each. So you would take, so, so basically Dr. Reynolds' fitness is two-thirds of Dr. Ronley and Dr. Vora's fitness. Now, all of these people are really not reproducing very much at all relative to the Duggars, because even Dr. Vora's three kids, that would be three divided by 19, or whatever they're up to now, um, which is a relatively small fitness. And so it's fitness, relative fitness is fitness scaled to the most fit individual in terms of number of offspring in, in the population. So you could, you could sit around and divide your pool of resources up among only two or three offspring and make those offspring a of really high quality, make them really big. But if somebody else is turning out 19 offspring, they're kind of flooding the market with, with offspring. Especially if your offspring that are twice as good in terms of survival quality don't actually have any difference in, in reproductive output. And so offspring quality is a tricky thing to quantify because one way of quantifying it is in reproductive output of those offspring, but another way to quantify it is by survival of those offspring. So um, these are the trade-offs that you have to make within a brood. This is just one example of the trade-off. This is with, um, with primates. And as you can see, the size of the offspring is on the x-axis, and the uh, rate of reproduction, or the number of offspring, is on the y-axis. And as offspring get bigger, uh, the reproductive rate, or the, the number of offspring on the y-axis, goes down. And this is like the classic size number trade-off from Walker at L 2008. I, although I could have pulled 150 of these types of graphs from a wide number of different different species. Then there's the whole trade-offs across broods issue. So if you invest too much in your current brood, it can do one of two things. It can reduce your survival so that that will be the last time that you breed. This is what similiparous organisms do. So remember the difference between similiparity
versus iteroparity. Similparis are those organisms that live to the end of their lifespan. At the end of their lifespan, they reproduce once and then they die. Iteroparis organisms are organisms that re reproduce season after season after season or year after year after year. Uh, so you'll have multiple reproductive bouts during your life. Yeah. The similparis, do they like die after their reproduction or do they only mate once? They generally die after they reproduce. Okay. So they only mate once, but then also they generally die right after that. And the, part of the reason that biologists think that they die right after that is they spend their whole lives storing up all of this energy. And then they blow all of that energy in one gigantic reproductive effort. And that one reproductive effort kind of wipes out all the energy that they have for growth and maintenance. And, and that's <coughs> the end. So century plants do this. Uh, species of agave uh, in the plant world, they, they live for long periods of time. They're called century plants because they supposedly live 100 years. They don't actually. But they live a really long time. And then they flower. And if you have a century plant growing in your garden, if you live in the desert southwest and then it flowers, you're bummed because in many cases um, that plant is then going to die right after that. So they put all of their energy into this one reproductive effort. They don't have anything left and, and they die. Uh, royal palms in Puerto Rico are the same way. Um, while I was working there as a postdoc, two royal palms, palms bloomed uh, right there like on the main drag going into the botanical garden in San Juan and everybody was bummed because it was great. Well, they're blooming, but then of course they died right after that. <laughs> Sadness. Um, the, um, that little mouse-like marsupial, uh, Antichinus stewardi, that is a small paris mammal species that lives its life, reproduces, uh, puts all of its off, all of its energy into that one reproductive effort, and then and then perishes after that. So, too much investment in the current breed reduces survival, or it can also just compromise your energy stores, which reduces future reproduction. So, any amount of energy that you put into the first reproductive effort might make the second reproductive effort less productive. Uh, Don Miles is a guy who's done a lot of work on lizard life history theory, and he did a study back in 2000. It was published back in 2000 on the uh, desert side blotch lizard. This is Uta stansburiana, and you can see that it has a little blotch on its side, which is where it gets its name. Um, what he looked at in this situation was he looked at uh, physiological performance as it was affected by reproduction. This is something similar to what Zach is doing in my lab right now. And what he found was that if you're carrying eggs versus after you've laid eggs, how does that affect your endurance? And so you can measure the endurance on a, in a lizard by literally just placing the lizard on a treadmill starting the treadmill and then seeing how long it runs until it finally gets so tired that it just stops running on the treadmill anymore. And what he had was he had unmanipulated females. So the, the open circle is females carrying eggs and then endurance after those females have laid those eggs. And then he had some females that were yolkectomized. What you can do with a lizard uh, this was a, a method that Barry Sinervo used on those lizards that we talked about when we talked about the rock, paper, scissors game. You can actually cut a little opening in the abdomen of, of the female and get access to her ovary, which are just kind of on the back side of, of her, her abdomen, but they're pretty big, so they're pretty easy to access. And when they're in the process of getting ready to reproduce, they start yolking up eggs. They yolk up follicles. And you can just take a little pin and you can pierce those follicles. When you pierce the follicles, uh, the animal just resorbs that energy. And so you can essentially prevent them from reproducing by essentially destroying their little developing follicles so that they go through that year without, um, without reproducing. You're still yolking part of the season, but in generally, those that had their yolk, the yolkectomy, had their follicles destroyed, were generally had more endurance, both pre-ova position and post-ova position. 
And they didn't do this with all of the eggs. What they did this was they yolkectomized some of the eggs, so they essentially reduced the investment in terms of the number of eggs that the female was carrying. And then they had some sham females where they cut them open and looked inside of there and pretended to poke around, but they didn't change the clutch size. And you see that the sham operated females are essentially not different from those individuals who are carrying eggs. So these are individuals carrying eggs. One is a control, one was operated on as if to give them the yolkectomy, but the other group has been yolkectomized such that they have fewer eggs than they would normally have. And what happens is before you drop your eggs, you have low endurance because of course you're carrying all this extra weight in terms of egg mass. And as soon as you drop those eggs, all of a sudden you have greater endurance because you're no longer carrying all of that egg mass. And when they looked at this as individuals, they found that as you were going through the process of yolking up your eggs, you start off with little tiny eggs and you keep adding yolk to them over the course of the reproductive season. So at the beginning of the reproductive season, you have really small, small eggs and they get bigger and bigger and bigger until you're ready to ovulate. And what you see is that as you increase the mass of your clutch up to the point of ovulation, you also lose endurance. So this, this difference in endurance in this situation here is due to the added mass of, of the eggs as determined by, by visual examination of the actual size, the diameter of the eggs. Uh, this is once again the... Um, Endurance, endurance after you've ovoposited and um, versus endurance when you're carrying, carrying the eggs from the previous graph. So in this case, if endurance influences, for example, your ability to avoid predation or something like that, you can run away, but you're not as fast and you can't run as long, then you're going to have possibly increased predation risk as a result of your current reproduction. So this would be a case where your current reproduction is actually endangering your future reproduction because you might not live to the next reproductive bout, whether that's later in the season or that's next year. Another situation, so that situation with Miles work was not described in your textbook. This is an example from your textbook. Looking at uh, passerine birds, passerine birds, remember, are songbirds. Uh, they looked at North American and South American birds. And here's the thing about birds. Birds in North America, how do you think about what happens to birds in North America? Like right now, birds are flying back from Central and South America back to North America. Do you guys think of, of, are birds in North America, are they migrating away from winter or are they migrating to summer? So when we think about bird migration, So here in North America, we oftentimes think of birds running away from winter. So we think birds migrate to Central America and South America to avoid winter. It's cold, there's less food, et cetera, et cetera. But here's another way of thinking about bird migration. Maybe birds migrate to North America from Central America and South America to take advantage
You can also think of migration as birds that normally live in Central and South America migrating to this empty environment in North America that, as it warms up, becomes flush with food with hardly any birds there to eat all that food. And actually, when you look at the birds that are migratory in North America, those are all birds that phylogenetically evolved first in the tropics. So these are tropical birds that move north to take advantage of uncompeted for food and then fly south when that food kind of dries up. So the, the kind of selective pressures that resident North American birds and resident South American birds deal with are different. So when I talk about resident birds, I'm talking about birds that live there and, and aren't migratory. And so if you look at North American birds and, and Central and South American birds, you find that they're under potential, potentially different selection pressures due to this seasonality in food abundance and overall levels of competition for food. So in North America, we tend to have bird species that produce large clutches and low adult survival to the next breeding season. So they tend to invest heavily in reproduction, and they're not saving back a bunch of energy to make it to the next year. And so they're acting more like a simulparous sort of organism. And so they put more of their energy into reproduction and save less back for growth and maintenance. Because <clears throat> it's going to be a tough winter. It's going to be hard to survive. So if your likelihood of survival is really low, you put a lot of investment in the current reproductive effort. South American birds, on the other hand, do just the opposite. They produce small clutches, and they generally have higher adult survival from one breeding season to the next breeding season. And so less investment in current reproduction, saving energy back for survival and future reproduction. Well, as it turns out, this might also have to do with predation pressures. So these people, Gallimbor and Martin, looked at different kinds of predators. And um, they exposed nests in both South American species and North American species to different kinds of predators. Hawks are generally predators on adult birds. And jays are predators on nests. So jays are smaller. They have weaker beaks, weaker feet. They tend to prey on nests. Hawks prey on the adult birds. So given that North American birds invest heavily in current reproduction and experience low adult survival, and South American birds invest less in reproduction and have high adult survival, Which predator do you expect North American birds and South American birds to respond to most when you think about a behavior such as nest visits? So you have to, if you're raising offspring, you have to visit the nest periodically because you have to feed the babies. But the problem with nest visits is what does visiting a nest communicate to everybody in the neighborhood? Hmm? It, it advertises where it is. So you can look at the response to, to the presence of a predator by looking at how many nest visits the parents make. That influences the amount of food that they get, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Based on this, would you expect North American birds to respond most to hawks or to jays? And same with South American birds based on that. You might expect them to respond more to jays, whereas South American birds, you might expect them to respond more to the presence of hawks. So what did they find? South American birds responded more strongly to hawks, and North American birds responded more strongly to jays. You didn't need to read the book to figure this out. You didn't need the slides to figure this out. You didn't need the figure from the book to figure this out. All you needed to know was some things about patterns of life history in these two different groups of birds. 
when you take North American birds and you expose them to a jay, they reduce their nest visits more drastically than the South American birds do. And when you take North American and South American birds and expose them to hawks, South American birds reduce the nest visits much more than the North American birds do. And that all comes back to how heavily are you investing in reproduction and what does that do to your future survival? If you're investing heavily in reproduction such that you have low adult survival, it doesn't really matter. If you get killed by a hawk, you're probably not going to be around next year anyway. But if you're investing heavily in reproduction, you want to beware of nest predators. In the same way, if you're investing less in the current reproduction, it doesn't really matter to you if a jay comes along and eats all of your eggs because you're going to live to the next breeding season to lay more eggs. What's really going to affect your fitness is if a hawk comes along and kills and eats you. One of the things that I like about animal behavior is that it's kind of intuitive in a lot of ways. A lot of these things that we talk about in animal behavior just kind of make sense if you stop and take a minute to think through the process. This happens to be one of those cases where the answer is really on the intuitive side, and that's actually one of the things I like about behavior. We're out of time. Do you have any questions? Want to revisit one thing? Just as a reminder. Do we know another advising day? Like no, day? only one advising day in the always in the spring. Okay. Always has been. Because you have fewer fewer students to advise because you don't advise seniors because they're not hopefully not going to be taking classes. Oh, there it is. Do, 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 Next Monday is the next exam. Um, we should be finished with parental care and family conflict um, probably before then. Um, so anyway, um, just to put that on your radar exam Monday, the 11th a week from today, in case it fell off your radar. I know you're probably not consulting the daily schedule like I am, but there it is. All right. If there are no questions, I will see you guys on Wednesday. And you're coming to my office right now? Okay. Yeah, that's fine.